Oh, hey. Hey, 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 People certainly love the character of Kramer. I mean, you know, you talk to most people, they'll tell you that they're, that's their favorite character. I think it's because it's so different. It's so weird and so odd. And so, and people, at the end of the day, it's like why action movies play well overseas. There's no dialogue. It's people running everything. And getting, this is an act, I mean, this is the Seinfeld action character. <laughs> Michael Richards had been on Fridays. We had both been on Fridays together. I said, I'd do the Friday show if I can have a thousand pounds of dirt on a set. And they go, what are you gonna do with that? I said, just a thousand pounds of dirt. I'll play in it for a few days and I'll show you something. <laughs> I was a big Michael Richards fan. I didn't know Michael. I was not familiar with Michael Richards at all. I had seen him from Fridays, and I, he used to go on Jay Leno those years. I don't know that I know Michael now, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm so familiar with Michael Richards now, either. <laughs> he, he was one of those very special, very rare talents that I had seen in, in my years in the business. The character of Kramer was based on my real next-door neighbor, Kenny Kramer. My neighbor was a guy who would come in, take a lot of my food, and he was a guy who didn't work, really. Or if he did, nobody really knew what he did. But what I knew is that he was in that apartment 22 out of the 24 hours of the day. People who ask me if Michael met with me to study me, the answer is no. He did not want to have anything to do with knowing about me. He just, you know, Larry wrote the words and he interpreted it himself. I played him very slow and uh, behind everything going on around him. Uh, pr presuming that he had really no contact with people. That's how the character was written, as a guy who came into Jerry's house, took his food, and, and was there all the time and didn't work, and could be a little uh, overbearing at times, and um, kind of was did pretty well with the, with the ladies, too, I, I might add. Larry knows me like a book, and so a lot of the ingredients in me, you know, the golf, the entrepreneurism, the... You know, hot tubs, raging heterosexuality, all that is me. But of course, Michael, you know, did his thing. Michael, of course, brought his own personality in, into the part, and uh, and it, he he created a character that really wasn't that, that evolved over over the years. It certainly wasn't what was in, originally intended. He wasn't quite sure where I was going with this character. It didn't quite fit in to how he saw. Kramer, we know it was Kenny, and his experiences there with him in New York. I took it. I, I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth when, when, when an actor is, is doing better with something than, than you've conceived it, you, you say, go ahead. Jerry, I'm going to find your stuff. I'm, I'm going to solve it. I, I'm on the case, buddy. I'm on the case. Yeah. Don't investigate. Don't pay me back. It was an accident. I made a mistake. These things happen. I'm human. <laughs> In your way. In one of the very first episodes, I remember Michael Richards turning to exit and hitting the door jam and shaking the whole set and everybody falling down laughing. And that was the beginning of Kramer in many ways. And I remember Larry David being concerned that Kramer was getting too big and too crazy. Nobody knew how to write for Michael. Nobody knew how to write for that that sensibility that he's got. Um, and I always tell people that um, this is one of the, the truest incidents of an actor showing the writers the way. When you look at Michael Richards, you see a guy who is a great physical comedian. You could not do the character of Kramer on Seinfeld and have Michael Richards play that part without that character being physical. I mean, even if you wrote it as a kind of shut-in, stay-at-home, kind of quiet, nudgy, annoying neighbor, the mere fact that this guy is brilliant physically, you'd have to incorporate that. The beautiful thing that Michael discovered, and I don't know at what point it was, maybe it was the second year, he was playing Kramer a little slower than the other three characters, a little dumber. 
And then he got the idea that he should play it, that everyone else is dumber than him. And that was the key to it. Once he got that, then the character just took off. How he conveyed that with the material he was given, I can't tell you. But I know that that was a, was a, was a switch that he really went for. And it was brilliant. And as soon as everybody caught on to what he was doing, they fed him the material that he could do it with. I began to feel that the Kramer character really became Kramer uh, when we did a show called The Statue, uh, where I went undercover to play a cop. Freeze, mother! Shut up! Oh, spread up. I said spread up. Oh, you're in big trouble, son. Burglary, grand larceny, possession of stolen goods, and, and murder! Murder! So keep them spread. You just make love to that wall, pervert. <laughs> the thing with Kramer, I think you could put that guy in any situation, any predicament, and it would work. I think because I was getting the laughs, they were going along with it. I remember one time Jerry asked me about the sideburns. He says, you're going to wear your sideburns that long? And I went, yeah. And he went, okay. <laughs> that was it, you know. But they saw this, this thing being born. I got a short haircut, and I kept pulling the top up. And as I was pulling it up, I just, I liked it. And I thought, I should do this down and pull that up. And I went, hmm. Yes, that's interesting, isn't it? Michael was probably the most appreciative actor in terms of wardrobe that I've ever worked with in my career. I thought that the clothing would be uh, late 60s, early 70s clothing, and it actually belongs to the character, that he just hasn't bought new clothing. So I wasn't going for a retro look as much as I was going for a clothing that he still owns and wears, and that's... The way he dresses. When I started working with him designing the show, he had a few vintage shirts in his closet. Most of the shirts that I had for, for Kramer were shirts that I shopped around for. Then they got a little harder to find as the character got very, very, very popular, particularly in the latter part of the 90s. Uh, that stuff you couldn't even find. So then I was searching for material and having the shirts made. We bought a huge stock of old fabric. And then we proceeded to make three and four of a kind so that when he would do these stunts, we would have enough shirts to cover us when he was drawing a, a line down a street with a paintbrush <laughs> or something like that. And the pants were always a little too short because my character had grown. I wasn't doing that for comedic purposes. It's just I felt these were pants that he wore at that time. So I always had my pants tailored a bit short with the white socks. Michael was the only actor that would basically come in every day of rehearsal and get his shoes. And they had white stars on them. They were sewn into the fabric of the shoe. And I blacked those out. There were nine stars. We did nine years. Very interesting, I thought. Because he could not really be that character without being in those shoes. They felt right. And they had a little, they had a little slide to them. And then suddenly I'm coming through the door at about 50 miles an hour. And then I went... <laughs> And the audience howled. And uh, I thought, this is the way to enter. I felt that that was Kramer's way of sliding into life. It was a metaphor of just coming in and he's ready to go. Literally, one of the doors came off the hinges one time, and uh, <laughs> we tried to find the best hardware we possibly could, and we had three or four sets on hand, just from one day to another, just to change the hardware. I do remember that door getting destroyed by the end of the season every year. <laughs> there came a point in, uh, I think maybe it was the third season, where 
he would start entering now and getting this wild applause from the audience. <laughs> yeah! All right. It sort of reminds me a little bit of TV from the 50s, like Jackie Gleason, when, when uh, Ed Norton used to come into the house. And I don't know, it, it, it went on for a while, and then I thought, I don't know, it's just kind of, it's, it's a little distracting. I understood why Larry wanted the audience to stop the applauding uh, when I would come in because it really, it really threw the, the, the tempo of the show off. We would all stand there and we had so much show to do. And it took up precious seconds that we needed in editing. Sometimes at the end of a scene we needed a stronger button, a stronger line and the writers would be staying around and I'd go, wait, let, and I'd, let's do, just do it or I'd get the line and I wouldn't even say the line, I'd just do it. You know, or, I think I was I used to do a. Well, he was always doing up. He would always try to find a way, and 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 he would do it differently on every take. He would try to find a way to give it that extra little pop, and and he always did. You know, I got that idea from an old sitcom uh, uh, called My Little Margie, where she used to go, you know, whenever she'd get into trouble. <laughs> I always was fascinated at how she could do a little sound that would just button up the whole scene so well. So I used to look for sounds or faces or things like that. Yeah. <laughs> when you work with Michael in a scene uh, in front of camera, where you can do it over and over again. Uh, Michael never does it the same way. So you can never be sure of how he's going to do it, which keeps you alert as to how you are going to uh, react. He did his own rehearsing, really, for, his, for particularly for his physical stuff. He had a, a different rhythm than the other cast members, all of whom are very good actors. But Michael is uh, a loner. It'd be great to catch a glimpse of him before he would make his big entrance into Jerry's apartment. There would be a couple times where I'd see him in the wings in that back hallway where he'd have his face up against the corner with his eyes closed saying the lines to himself. And you could see him, it's like before the entrance on stage, you could just see him just like getting geared up and he'd start pacing and he'd start working himself up. Um, and uh, he would come out and explode and it was just just pure brilliance that would unfold. I told you. What? I told you she liked me. Who? Sister Roberta. How do you know? She told me. She says she's never had a man stir up all these feelings inside of her. She's questioning her faith. She's thinking of leaving the church. Wow. Oh, right. This power. <laughs> Look what I'm doing. I'm dangerous, Jerry. I'm very, very dangerous. <laughs> I loved exploring the sexuality of Kramer. I always wondered, how does this guy do it? Just being physical, just being truthful. Kramer had feeling. Kramer was always saying what was on his mind, and I think a woman uh, enjoys that. It's amazing how many beautiful women live in New York. I actually find it kind of intimidating. Well, you're as pretty as any of them. Just need a nose job. <laughs> There is an insanity in Michael that has nothing to do with Kramer. People always say to me, is, is, is he really like Kramer? And I say, absolutely not. They're both mad, but in completely different ways. He is a gifted comedic sense on every level. Uh, vocally, physically, uh, facially, you know, he's like all over the keyboard. Michael Richards, as a, as a person, is an enigma, kind generous, unusual. He's a nut. I had the feeling that I, that I had like a, uh, a, a path to his mind. I really did. I felt that we were like brothers of some sort. I mean, and I think we, we really were in some, some, some context. I'd come on as kind of a two with Michael. Kramer and Newman teamed up, and Michael didn't like working this way, that 
part of the way he worked was on repetition and on feeling uh, very secure in what he was doing. He would be, <laughs> in the last weeks of the show, he'd be behind the set rehearsing on his own, running lines, coming up with another sound or another thing, another, you know, physicality he could do. He was tireless. The rest of us went, you know how to get a laugh. If George does a snort laugh, that'll get a laugh. If Elaine does a, you know, body flip, she gets the laugh. We had things we could fall back on. He didn't want to fall back. He wanted to keep finding something new. I had seen how much he rehearsed to, to have that character pay off. And I was amazed. And he was funny. He was funny, boy. When Michael and I would work together, I knew from the first day that he was really going to get into it because he would take me and I would just pretty much relax my muscles and, and he would move and I would hold on to him and make sure that he didn't throw me around the room. But he would move in such a way that it looked like I was throwing him around, but really he was moving me around. A lot of times when you're on a set, uh, a sitcom set, you do your scene and you go back to your room or you just hang out on stage and wait around for your scene, your next scene to come up. But Michael and I would go off to whatever set we were supposed to be on and rehearse all the physical stuff, you know? So that definitely helped our relationship and it helped me from getting injured. <laughs> Whenever I was near Michael doing a physical bit, it was a little bit like taking, well, it was a little bit scary, to tell you the truth, because Michael could do anything. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Michael hit me in the head with a golf clubs once and cut my eye in the middle of shooting. And, and, and this was right on the... I don't remember what episode that was, but he had golf clubs. And it was right and right before we shot it, I said, are you going to be OK with that? And he goes, don't worry, I've never hurt anyone. I swear to you, he said that. And then I got a huge shiner and a big cut right here. Oh, was a river. Oh, oh, all right. Yeah. You all right? Oh, yeah. I'm not all right. <laughs> I love him with all my heart, though. And I will tell you that uh, watching these, in anticipation of this interview, watching all these shows, Michael Richards kicks ass in the comedy department. Here's to feeling good all the time. conviction of the man is unsurpassed. So much so that if you screw up his scene, he could really lose his temper. I'd get angry, actually. I'd say, I'd say come on, don't. You know, I just felt it was unprofessional. I mean, come on, you know, keep it going. Is that really you? That was you, huh? <laughs> What's the matter with you? <laughs> Stick around a while. <laughs> or we'll beat you with a four by four. I never broke character. It's like being in church. You're not supposed to laugh in church. It's sort of the same thing working because it's so serious. The work is so serious. Maybe I was taking things too seriously. I, I think I'll let you do it. Well, it's easy. Just do it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I can't work. <laughs> he drove himself <laughs> to these levels of creativity that were um, extraordinary. And I, I don't think I've ever come across another actor that, not that there aren't other dedicated actors, but would have the combination of that kind of manic drive, that offbeat sensibility, and, and just the genetics of what his body became to create that character it was it, it was you know one of those kismet meetings of of actor and role that becomes legendary he was he was the only one the emmy goes to michael richards
Thank you, and thank you to the Academy for this wonderful honor. I thank you very much. And to Jerry and Julia and Jason, it, what a pleasure to be working with such a sound ensemble. Thank you very much. Anytime I was up against Michael, I went, good night. <laughs> I'm not getting this. And, and, you know, I was always up against Michael. I was just always surprised when, when other people would beat him. That was, that was the shock. The popularity of Seinfeld was just so amazing. I remember I would take trips during the summer to just get away, get out of the States. And I remember I went to Bali and I went deep into the jungles. One of the oldest primitive Buddhist tribes is there. And they're naked running around there. And, I, and I, some of these, these people, they saw me in the jungle and they went, And they went running, and I found out later they had a long cable stretched a thousand feet through the jungle to this hut where they had a television. And they would all get in there at night and watch this episode dubbed in some language. Well, well, he had bought something and it started to come out of his head. Well, and then... Well, I'm going to have a role in the film. Wow, I swear. But it's super. I didn't realize until after Seinfeld was over just what an impact that show had. My God, you know, people are grateful for the, those nights weekly where they got to watch a show they all loved. That's amazing to be a part of that kind of experience. I'm grateful for that. All this time, I'm trying not to be me. I'm afraid to face who I was. But I'm Cosmo, Jerry. I'm Cosmo Kramer. And that's who I'm going to be. From now on, I'm Cosmo. <laughs> Look for more exclusive interviews with your favorite Seinfeld stars in future volumes of Seinfeld on DVD from Columbia TriStar Home Entertainment.